Welcome back, you guys. It's 2024 and time for a whole new year of study. Although for a lot of you, this is not a whole new year. We began in the Book of Mormon way back in 2020, and now we are finally circling all the way back. And I got to tell you, I can't wait to be here. This is something I've been looking forward to for all these four years of study. Something about getting to this point where we've studied all the books together, and now we have this deep well of understanding that we can pull from and take it with us as we go into this next year. Sometimes I think it's a little hard with this cyclical nature of our scripture study in the church because it feels like you're going back across the same ground. But I really liked, there's this visual that Elder Holmes put forth. He had a BYU devotional a couple years ago where he talked about the spiral staircase in the Nauvoo Temple. And he was talking about how our progression is kind of like that spiral staircase, that it is this slow, steady ascent up. And that's kind of how I see scripture study, especially when we cycle through these books of scripture. Where we were in the Book of Mormon five years ago is not where we are today. I feel like even though we're seeing a similar vista, it's like we've gone up that spiral staircase a rung and now we are seeing it from a whole new vantage point. I had this sweet experience as I was going into the Orem Temple open house with a friend recently. And there's this big, I mean, almost cavernous type space where this giant spiral staircase circulates around. And even though you think you've seen that room from the ground, every level up you went, you saw the windows differently. You saw the artwork differently. That's what's going to happen for us in the Book of Mormon this year, you guys. The insights will change, the creative will change, and we'll get a whole new vantage point on what the Lord wants us to learn. And I hope you're going to love it. I think I have to warn you ahead of time that there are some changes in the course as well, but I think changes for the good. So as I've been praying and trying to understand what it is I'm supposed to do differently this time around, I got some impressions. I wish they had come all at once, but instead they came kind of piecemeal over the last few months. But here's where things are going to go in this course. Basically, since the last four years of study, we've done kind of a chapter by chapter approach to all of the books. I'm hoping to keep all that in the archive and let you access it all the time. But this year, we're going to shift gears a little bit and change it up. My goal with this year's course and any course I teach going forward is to ignite fires. So I know you guys know me well by now that I have a love of fire, but this one comes from somewhere deeper. In fact, it inspired the logo for our new title of Our Mothers Knew It. I really love that talk from Elder Holland where he, he taught about good teaching. And he said, a good teacher will not see students as containers to be filled, but fires to be ignited. And that's the impression I got when I was thinking about how to change up this course. I wanted to find ways to maybe model better what my scripture study looks like so that you're not just hearing my insights and getting my ideas, but you're seeing new sparks in your own study. I know that's happened for a lot of you as you've studied on your own with or without me over the last few years, but I'm hoping to make it more obvious. So this year in the course, we're going to change the flow. Rather than going chapter by chapter, I'm going to give you seven sparks that I see. I'm going to dial in on seven areas where I saw something catch my eye. And then when I went back into those verses or back into that story and fanned those flames, fire came out. Like I got spiritual understandings that I didn't have before I began. That's what I'm hoping to show you in the insights videos. When we shift into the next video, we have one called questions. So you'll see it tucked at the end of all these insights. You'll see five questions. The goal with questions is that you'll be able to get the Spirit to teach you things. I'm hoping to take some of the things I normally would have just kind of crammed in here and added and instead inspire you to get your own ideas and understandings. It's part of the reason we built the community page gather.mechmom.com because I'm hoping to start powerful conversations. I hope to plant in your mind ideas and questions that you could talk with your kids about, you could talk to your classes about, you could bring up in a Gospel Doctrine lesson and just let the Spirit teach. And then hopefully as new insights and understandings come to you, you share them with us in the community, either on the page or in the live or just with the people around you. I hope those questions inspire you. So first you'll see seven insights, sorry, seven <laughs> insights. Then you'll see five questions. And then of course, because this course began with Creative Come Follow Me and will continue as our mothers knew it, you'll also have three object lessons. So each week I'll give you three object lessons. Some will be pulled from the archive because they're just too good to skip over. And I think 
teaching them again will ignite new fires, but also new things that you haven't seen before. My hope with the three object lessons always is that it will help you fan the flames of excitement for others. As you teach more creatively and as you share the gospel with whoever you come in contact with in these surprising, memorable ways, that you'll delight in it. To me, it's not so much that object lessons will perfect the testimonies of your kids or your classes. I hope that happens, but it, it probably won't. What I do think it will do is ignite the fire brighter in you. Because when I teach with creativity, with my family or the classes I'm in, I find their enthusiasm and watching their reactions to things, watching their curiosity open up about the scriptures, that feeds me. It's almost like the fans of little flames that have started in my own scripture study get waved with big whooshes of oxygen when I see somebody else delight in the scriptures. And that brings me back to the beginning and makes me want to start to study again the next week. So that's my goal with this course. We're going to have a seven, five, three, seven key insights to spark ideas, five great questions to help you have good conversations, and three object lessons to help you teach them powerfully. That's my hope for this course, you guys. I think it will make a big difference in how this feels. It might make a difference in the length of things and how I approach the scriptures, but I think you'll love it. Just please remember that if you're used to what is familiar, you can always find those videos and the podcasts on the archive. You can go to gather.macmom.com and find all the archive of those videos. You can also go into the weekly notes. So the weekly notes will remain kind of similar to how they have been in the years in the past, simply because that's how I study. So if you wanna to go to that shared Google doc, you can see all of the insights I have, not just the seven that I am going to bring up in today's videos, but I, I hope it will help you see more. If you want to study deeper, you can access those other areas and hopefully join the conversation. So with that being said, you guys, it's time to get started. In this first week, in week one, you're not even into the Book of Mormon technically yet, although you are in the published Book of Mormon, meaning from the very beginning, there have been these introductory pages to help you see what's coming. I actually really liked the Come Follow Me manual's description of what you should expect this week. If you look in that intro paragraph, it talks about how the Book of Mormon is not an ordinary book, that it has this epic backstory. And that's why you want to get into the intro pages, because it helps you it sets the stage for what is in store. It also gives you an understanding about what the book is for. The, the intent of this book is not to entertain. It is not to dazzle you with history you never knew existed. It is all about helping people come unto Christ, to convince all people that Jesus is the Christ. And the same Christ who cared about his people then cares about his people today. And that his path is the only path. Just like where we ended with the book of Revelations, it flows right into these intro pages of the Book of Mormon. You're also going to see the story of the witnesses. So from the very beginning in its first publication, the Book of Mormon has always had this initial section of witnesses. The three witnesses who had a bit of a spiritual experience where they see artifacts and they have an angel before them and they hear the voice of the Lord. I mean, these are big, powerful spiritual witnesses. And then the eight witnesses that you'll also read that have a more tangible experience. Theirs is with Joseph Smith. He shows them the plates. They get to heft them and see the engravings. Theirs is a tangible witness of what they saw and felt that day. And the two combine to create this really lovely powerhouse of intrigue. That's what I think it's intended to do. When you read those, those intro pages, especially if you try to do it with fresh eyes, it will intrigue you to study, right? This is a story that has an origin unlike any other, and it makes you want to turn the page. In fact, the capstone for me is what you get in Joseph Smith's Witness. So this is not the first vision. What you find in those intro pages is Joseph's experience with the angel Moroni and the bringing forth of the plates and how the translation occurred to some degree and where it all went, right? This is how it came to be where it is today. That's what you get from Joseph's story. But you also get this resounding witness of God still speaks to his people and he still has a plan for them and he has a prophet to lead them. And it is just this drumbeat that will urge you into flipping the page. I think it's a powerful week of study. So grab your scriptures, grab your notes. It's time to get started.
All right, are you ready for spark number one? <laughs> Remember, this is, these are just the things that caught my eye, but there are many, many more. You'll find a bunch more in the notes and a lot more as you get into the verses and study. But let me show you a few things that caught my eye. This first one came from the title page. So just to give you a basic summary, that title page that behind the first one that says like another witness of Jesus Christ is the title page written by the hand of Moroni. Just two paragraphs, it's really simple. It's not written by Joseph Smith. It's actually a translation of a plate that he found at the very end of the plates he was translating, which I find kind of fascinating that this wasn't at the beginning. It's almost something Moroni wrote at the very, very end to help people understand what is in this book. I was recording a Sikh course for Deseret Book maybe a year or so ago, and they did this interesting thing where they had me, I had laid out the full course, I'd written it all out, we went there to record it, and they had me record the whole course, all the different lessons. And then at the very end, they had me record the introduction lesson. And I thought it was so odd at the time. I was like, why am I, why am I saying this now? And when I talked to the producer, she talked to me about it and said, basically, now you know what you've taught and you know how excited you are about it and what was, what jumped out at you as you were speaking it, put that energy into the introduction so that people are eager to listen. And I wonder if that's what happened with Moroni as well that after he'd watched his dad pretty much give his whole life for this great work. And then Moroni took decades after to add his witness and to just survive in preserving these plates. I think he has a, a very condensed, simple witness of, of what is there. I really love paragraph two. It, it's in the beginning, you learn what the purpose of this work is and the intent of it. And then paragraph two, you get Moroni's edition about the Jaredites. So it says, an abridgment taken from the book of Ether also, which is a record of the people of Jared, who were scattered at the time of the Lord, that the time of the Lord confounded the language of the people when they were building a tower to get to heaven, which is to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers, that they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast off forever. I love that we have this whole paragraph about the story of the Jaredites, because this was mostly Moroni's work. This is something that came after Mormon had finished. He had always hoped to write about the Jaredites. In fact, he kind of alludes to that earlier in the Book of Mormon, but he didn't get to it. And so this is Moroni's work to make sure that his dad's work is complete. And he writes the story of the brother of Jared and their epic voyage. What I think caught my eye in this paragraph is I love the idea that there are great things in that story that are supposed to remind me about covenants with God and the power of keeping covenants. For me, some of the things that you learn from the brother of Jared's story, just even that beginning part of their story, like getting to the barges and crossing. First, I think you learn that he has a journey in mind for all of us. I think when I read that story, it reminds me that God has somewhere he wants me to go. He sent me to this mortal life, not just to endure it or even endure it well, but to become something, to get to the Maria at the end of this life. That's what he's hoping for me. So we have this journey. But I think the story also reminds us that we will be blessed through by God in this effort. As we try to become what he wants us to be, he will bless us. The brother of Jared was blessed with their language not being confounded, with the ideas to make barges, the instructions for how to build barges and how tight to make them. Like he was blessed all along that way. Another thing that I love is in the brother of Jared's story, you learn about repentance too. I think oftentimes when we are directed to be on this great journey to become something better, we get to kind of a plateau place and we want to stay. You know, I, I talked to my YSAs about this um, earlier. I just think it's it's tempting to hang out on the beach. We get to a place where we think we're going to be comfortable and the Lord has blessed us enough. And we're like, you know what? I think we're good. And so we sit on the beach. Remember the brother of Jared stays on the beach for four years and doesn't pray. In my opinion, I think he probably prayed a lot. I just think he's not praying about forward movement anymore. He's probably just content. You know, the same way when we'll read about Lehi and Nephi and as they're going to the land bountiful, Laman and Lemuel want to stay. They're like, this is a pretty nice place. I just think we tend to get comfortable because we've received blessings and the Lord is still trying to get us to cross those great waters. What I think is really powerful about the brother of Jared's story is that it takes two verses for forgiveness to be given and the brother of Jared to be back on his track. You know, it's not 
it's two verses, you guys, from where he learns that he should have been praying all this time and that the Lord still has a work for him to do. And in two verses, he's back on track and building barges and getting the people across. And that I think is something powerful about covenants. That's why I think Moroni included this piece so prominently here on the title page. His story teaches us about the power of covenants. The last thing I think the brother Jared's story teaches me, and we'll get into this, you know, obviously at the end of the year, but I love that the brother Jared came to the Lord hoping to get light in his vessel. He comes in this epic way, making these stones to try to get light. And what the Lord gives him is so much more than just light for his vessels. He gives him something grander. He gives him an inside view of him, who the Lord is, what he looks like, what kind of person he is, and what he has planned for his children. He gives the brother of Jared eternal light when he actually just wanted these stones to light up. And I just think that's the nature of these journeys. That's why we can't get comfortable on the beach. And that's why we need to pay attention to the words of the Book of Mormon, because they will urge us to get off our beaches of comfort and our you know, bountifuls and to push into those stormy waters. When we have the courage to actually go forward into those stormy waters, that's when miracles happen. And that's when we learn great things. I just think for me, that's why there's so much emphasis on this story in the title page of the Book of Mormon. My next spark came at the very end of the title page, the end of paragraph two, and this is what it reads. And also to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. And now if there are faults, they are the mistakes of men. Wherefore, condemn not the things of God, that ye may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. For me, I think the reason this caught my eye is because I wrestle with guilt a lot. (laughs) Maybe you do too, but I... You know, I am a much better teacher to my younger three than I was to my older three because I was young and I didn't know what I was doing. And I sometimes worry, in fact, I still worry with even the younger three that the gaps in my efforts to teach the gospel diligently will hinder them. You know, I can see how he gave me this great work to do and I got to some places where I hung out on a beach and I didn't... I didn't work as diligently as I could have, or I didn't, you know, advance my testimony as well as I could have. And I, I feel this sense of guilt and weakness. And I loved this verse for that because I feel like the more I went back and studied this spark and fanned it a little bit to try and understand what the Lord was teaching me, I felt like he was trying to say, your job doesn't need to be perfect. The same way Moroni never felt like his work was perfect. Remember at the end of the Book of Mormon when he talks about his weakness in writing and how he's so worried that men are going to judge the work unfairly because of his weakness. That's how I feel as a parent. I'm worried that my kids are going to abandon their testimony because I didn't do a great job teaching it. And I just think Moroni's message is a hopeful one. He's saying our job is to help people know upfront clearly that if there are mistakes, if I go through stretches where I drop scripture study altogether, or if I teach things wrong, or I don't know my history or whatever, that I can tell my kids, if you see mistakes in our family's efforts to do this come follow me together, they're the mistakes of me. They're not the mistakes of God. His work is a perfect work. And the promise is if we can testify of that over and over again, just like Moroni does, then the grace of Christ will pour in and the gaps and the crevices that I see get filled. That's what grace is. You guys, we studied that all throughout the New Testament, that all these things that are broken or wounded or damaged or not enough have grace added to them and then they become enough. I, To me, there is so much hope in that message because I will never be anywhere close to perfect. And I can't go back in time and fix the things I did wrong. So I love knowing that through the grace of Christ, it can be enough. If he can heal a leper and he can make palsied legs walk and he can make little loaves and fishes turn into enough to feed thousands, he can fill the gaps in my parenting efforts and it will be enough. There's a verse that I really love that helps me remember my part of the equation. It's in DNC 64, 33 and 34. Wherefore, be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. 
what I like about that verse is the foundation's not pretty, you guys. I am laying the foundation layer. It's not even the part that's going to be above the surface. I feel, I feel like that's my job. My job is to just get that concrete in, make sure it has some rebar covenants built in there so that they have this sturdy foundation to begin from. But most of the work of their testimony is going to happen after they go. The same way most of my testimony came after I left the house and started to learn for myself. I loved that little foundation line. It helped me be like, this doesn't have to be perfect. This is concrete. I can do concrete. In 34, it says, Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. That's all we have to offer you guys. A willing heart, a willing mind. Try. Put your efforts in. Make them good efforts. Do the best you can. And then trust that you can, you know, you can rest easy on the promise that after you've done all that you can, he will he will supplement, he will add. There's this great part, we'll study it later, but in First Nephi, when Nephi's talking about building a ship and he gets direction on how to build the ship. And there's this one little line that when I studied the Book of Mormon earlier this year, I think it was back in the spring, it like leapt off the page at me. This is First Nephi 17, seven and eight. It says, and it came to pass that after I Nephi had been in the land of Bountiful for the space of many days, the voice of the Lord came unto me saying, arise, get thee into the mountain. And it came to pass that I arose and went up into the mountain and cried unto the Lord. And this is eight. And it came to pass that the Lord spake unto me saying, thou shalt construct a ship after the manner which I shall show thee, that I might carry these people across the waters. It's that last line that gave me hope. Nephi's job was to build a ship the best he could. It may have looked like a foundation. I know sometimes we see paintings of Nephi's ship and it looks beautiful and amazing. I wonder if it was a lot rougher. <laughs> it doesn't matter because the Lord blessed it, right? Because the Lord's job is to carry them across the waters. That's comforting to me. As you approach, come follow me this year, especially this study of the Book of Mormon. Don't feel like you have to do everything perfectly or that you're only valuable if everybody gets on board. The Lord's job is to carry the people across the waters. Your job is just to build the boat. Do the best you can. Use his guide, guidance. Use his prophets to help you know what to do. Use his scripture. And if you do that, your, your family will be carried one way or another. The third spark hit me on the introduction page. Actually, there's lots of other ones, but there's a, there's a really good one on the introduction page, especially in paragraph three. The introduction is different than the title page. So the title page is written by the hand of Moroni, translated by Joseph Smith. This one is different. It's almost like the gospel topics essays or the saints or revelation in context. This is something that was written to help clarify what the Book of Mormon is by modern writers. So it's amended from time to time. Things are tweaked here and there, but the message is the same. It's to introduce us to what the Book of Mormon is all about. The first one came out, I believe, in 1981, but you can go in the notes and learn more about that. The spark hit me in paragraph three. It says, The crowning event recorded in the Book of Mormon is the personal ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ among the Nephites soon after his resurrection. It puts forth the doctrines of the gospel, outlines the plan of salvation, and tells men what they must do to gain peace in this life and eternal salvation in the life to come. What I like about that is the two-pronged promise at the end. It just caught my eye. This idea of the Book of Mormon not just being a way for us to know Christ so that we can get to that glorious next life. It's both. The Book of Mormon is our guide to make this life better. Remember, President Hinckley said this life is not just to be endured, it's to be enjoyed. And I think the Book of Mormon helps you do that. I think it's all about becoming something better, setting aside the natural man and becoming more like your Savior every single day. The whole idea being like, you feel more joy and more fullness in this life as you pursue that course. I just think there's promise in it. I also really like that he tells you immediately in the introduction, or they tell you in the introduction, where to go for fast growing seeds. That same paragraph where it talks about the center point, this crowning event is when the Savior's ministry occurs. So remember how I told you a couple, I guess it's maybe in like six months or so, I went to speak to a group of women and I taught them about scripture study and how my my perspective is that sometimes scriptures don't taste good. And, you know, you'll go and you'll read it, especially at a time like this, you guys, like at the beginning of the year, a new book of scripture opens up for Come Follow Me. And you're like, this is my year. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So you buy the highlighters and you buy all the manuals and you do all the things and you expect that you're going to sit down and it's going to open up for you and it's going to taste good. What I've learned is scripture study doesn't taste good at first. I actually think sometimes the fruit of the spirit that you get from scripture study is an acquired taste. 
it, it takes effort and time and diligence before that seed softens and produces fruit that tastes good. <laughs> and so it takes a minute. What I love about this paragraph is it focuses our eyes and says, if you need fast growing seeds, like if your testimony is struggling about scripture study and you're like, scriptures just don't resonate for me. I taste them and they just don't taste good. What they're trying to say here is go to third Nephi, go to that visit from the savior. When you read his words and you see how he interacted with the children and the people who were sick and needed healing and how he taught his apostles and you hear his sermon on the mount, those are fast growing seeds. When you plant those spiritual seeds, you get fruit fast. The same way when I talked to those women about scripture study, I said, tell me what seeds I should plant if I'm going to start a garden. And every single person said tomatoes because tomatoes are delicious. Everybody can eat them. You can put them on a whole bunch of things and they're hard to kill. <laughs> Third Nephi is the tomatoes of the Book of Mormon. You guys, it is something that you can go to and it will grow fast. It will soften your heart. It will be, you will taste it and you'll start to see how the scriptures can begin to be delicious unto you. That's the promise. And I feel like that's why they put this focal point on these verses. There's this great quote from Elder Suarez. He says, to all who hear my voice today, I invite you to be part of this marvelous coming forth of the Book of Mormon in your own life. I promise you that as you prayerfully and consistently study its words, you can partake of its promises and rich blessings in your life. He's inviting you to take a bite. And this introduction is focusing you saying, let me tell you where the sweetest part of that fruit is. It's right here in 3rd Nephi. You'll find spark number five on that introductory page as well. So this is paragraph eight. We invite all men everywhere to read the Book of Mormon, to ponder in their hearts the message it contains, and then to ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if the book is true. Those who pursue this course and ask in faith will gain a testimony of its truth and divinity by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the this course part that caught my eye. I think this isn't an equation. I think sometimes when I teach this, I tend to make it sound like if you'll just do A, B, and C, then you'll get D. Like that's often how we say it, but it's a course. He's trying to give us a way to do things, a manner of doing things. How we get to that end destination where we know things will be different for all of us. Some of you have had incredible experiences with the Book of Mormon where you read Moroni 10 and you have a lightning moment and you know, and then you build on that knowledge over the course of your lifetime. Others of you, more like me, read that verse many times and didn't have anything happen and maybe even got psyched out thinking that you were missing something. I just think this is a course, you guys. It's supposed to help us. These are guideposts to navigate our life by almost like a map. But the promise is by the end of the map, whatever our journey looks like, however that GPS routed us, we'll come to know the truth of all things. That's what I love about these verses. So if you actually go into Moroni 10, so I just finished the Book of Mormon today. This is the first time in my entire life, you guys, that I read the Book of Mormon twice in a year. <laughs> Maybe you guys have done that a hundred times. This was new to me, but I just wanted to read throughout my morning breakfast. I had so much New Testament to study, but I was determined that if I just read at breakfast time, I could get it through. I, I Not only did I get through the Book of Mormon, I read it twice, you guys. So I got to Moroni 10 today. This is what I read. Behold, I would exhort you that when you shall read these things, if it be wisdom in God that you should read them, then you would remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men from the creation of Adam, even down unto the time that ye shall receive these things and ponder it in your hearts. And when you shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the eternal father in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if you, if you shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. Okay, here's what I love about this combination with Moroni's words and also what you read in the introduction. I think the Book of Mormon is a gateway to know all things. Not because a testimony of the Book of Mormon makes it so I don't have to work and know anything else. I can just assume that Joseph Smith is real and I can assume that prophets are real and that's not what I think he's trying to teach us here. I think he's saying by living the principles of the Book of Mormon, putting them into action in your life, following this course, you can know all things. It's almost like, you know, we, we describe it as a keystone. We'll talk about that again in the object lessons. And I love the keystone approach, but I think what we need to focus on is it's it's like a Rosetta Stone. <laughs> like once you come to understand the Book of Mormon, meaning you have a testimony of it, you understand how to ask God, how to receive answers, how to make and keep covenants with God, how to see 
history of people who have done these same things and and thrive off their testimonies. Once you get in that habit of understanding the Book of Mormon, you can know the truth of all things. It opens up an opportunity to have a witness that prophets are real. When I study the Book of Mormon and I get the patterns, then I can understand church history better. I can understand things like the Book of Revelation or Isaiah better because I studied the Book of Mormon. It is this gateway. It's an opening for us to understand all things. And going all the way back to the brother Jared's story that we talked about at the beginning, it's one of the things I love about his story, you know, that he, he came expecting one thing and the Lord wanted to give him so much more. You might come to the Book of Mormon hoping to have a witness of the Book of Mormon's truthfulness. And by Moroni 10, I sure hope you get it. But I think that's not supposed to be the end. In fact, I'm certain it isn't. It's supposed to be a gateway where because you've learned how to know for yourself, now you can apply that course to all the other questions and hopes and dreams you have and understandings will open up. Revelation will flow in because you know the pattern. That's what you see with the brother Jared. And I think you see it on the introduction page here as well. The sixth spark hit me as I was studying the stories of the witnesses. So if you see them, they're both printed on the same page usually. You can see the story of the three witnesses and then the story of the eight witnesses. They're testimonies. It doesn't give you the full story. In fact, you can go back in the archive if you want to watch those DNC lessons. That would give you a lot of good context. There's a lot in the notes as well. But if you want to get more of the backstory, but this is their actual witness of what occurred. And it was comparing those two paragraphs that I found so intriguing. That's where the spark hit for me. So I had to go back and study some more. And as I found those flames, I found myself curious, first off, that we have a witness at all. You know, why didn't the Lord just put his work out there? Why do, why do there need to be witnesses? Why couldn't he just put the Book of Mormon out without them? And one, I'm sure the law of witnesses involved, this is the Lord's pattern. But two, I think he does this out of a profound love for us and his desire to do as much as he can within the bounds of agency to entice us home. My favorite talk about this is from Elder Lund. He gave a BYU devotional maybe a year ago where he talked about flashes of light and these moments in his life where clearly the divine is at play. You know, he's, he doesn't talk about like he understands everything. He, he helps you understand that those occur. In fact, here's his introductory paragraph for one of them. He says, Heavenly Father purposefully designed and ordered our world to require us to walk in faith. He pressed into place the pieces of this sophisticated jigsaw puzzle of mortality, but held back a few of the pieces which he keeps in his pocket to ensure that faith is required as we come up against the gaps in this puzzle's spiritual landscape. He has ensured that we will not be able to game the system by thinking our way into heaven, to discover him through provable math or science which would obviate faith and foreclose the purposes of mortality. Then he fills his whole talk with flashes of light all these stories where he says, even though that's God's plan, he will do everything he can to, so you can catch a glimpse. You know, you can almost picture a veil as it's moving, that you catch a glimpse of what's on the other side. You, It's transparent or even translucent, and you can kind of catch an idea, an idea. And then at the very end of his talk, he says this, all evidence, meaning all these stories, evidence a pattern of the veil leaking light as the Savior relentlessly pierces it to bless his own. And then he talks about how his testimony has built up over a thousand flashes of light. And I just, that's what I think of when I think about the witnesses. I think that's why they're in here. They are witness that the Savior is piercing that veil, that these men have these incredible experiences. The three witnesses have a spiritual experience of sorts. They actually see an angel come. They handle all the artifacts, like the sword of Laban and the plates, and they, they see more things than the others do. They hear the voice of God. Like they are, they have a very spiritual, miraculous experience. The eight witnesses below them have a different one. Joseph Smith shows them the plates. Still miraculous, right? These are plates that have lasted since Moroni put them in the box. <laughs> like that is, they are still miraculous in nature. The fact that they came forth is miraculous, but they get to see a more tangible physical experience. They get to handle the plates, see the engravings, heft it to see how heavy they are. They're the ones that tell you that they think they're made of gold because they have the appearance of gold. That, that's where that comes from. And I found myself seeing like, this is the Lord piercing through that veil to send a bright flash of light out. And he wants someone to record it. The same way last week when we studied John in the book of Revelation and how he, in that moment when he described 
what Jerusalem will look like, this holy celestial city, you know, the, the city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. It's like the Savior came and slashed a huge slice through the veil and said, I just want you to see. I want you to see how good this is. I want you to know why you want to come home. I love that, that we have the witnesses here because to me, they are bright flashes of light. Even though they don't always stay loyal to Joseph Smith. Some leave the church for a time. Some never come back. None of them deny their witness of what they experienced on these days of encountering the plates. And that to me is powerful. When you read their paragraphs, they're a little too long for me to read here, but their different experiences are instructive to me too. I, I think those same paragraphs help you see that revelation comes in different ways. Revelation comes to your heart. It comes to your mind. You see that in Doctrine and Covenants. You see it all over the place. I love this quote from Richard G. Scott. He's referring to DNC 8 too, where it says, Yea, behold, I will teach you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. And then this is Elder Scott. An impression to the mind is very specific. Detailed words can be heard or felt and written as though the instruction were being dictated. A communication to the heart is a more general impression. The Lord often begins by first giving impressions. Where there is recognition of their importance and they are obeyed, one gains more capacity to receive more detailed instruction to the mind. An impression to the heart, if followed, is fortified by a more specific instruction to the mind. I feel like that's what happens with the witnesses. You have this spiritual understanding given to these three, and then this more physical understanding given to these eight. And when you put them together, you have this witness, right? Something that's hard to refute, something that you can't talk yourself out of. It's not a dream. It's not, you know, it's not something that, a trick of the light. There's, there's too much, right? There's physical and there's spiritual, so you can't deny it. I think that happens for us spiritually all the time. When I lean into promptings, even if I don't understand them, like things about this course and changes we needed to make, I didn't know how that was all going to play out, you guys, but we kind of kept, we kept taking a few more steps forward thinking that, understanding would come. And then I would get an understanding to my mind. As I moved forward and I made spiritual choices, insights would come to my mind. And I'd be like, oh, this is actually the tool I'm going to put to use to make the community happen. Oh, this is what the name of the course needs to be right now. Like Those things came as I leaned on those spiritual promptings. I feel like that's what, in addition to flashes of light, the witnesses of these 11 men and the witness of Joseph Smith, they offer this very full faceted perspective, this lens you can look through to see clearly that what is capable what is capable of happening in your life, that God still speaks to his people and he hopes to speak to us. I, I just think it's it leaps off the page. Spark number seven comes in the testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith. There's a lot in here to love. And again, you can go on the Doctrine and Covenants in the archive and learn more about this experience with Moroni at age 17 when Joseph understands what he's supposed to do, at least to a better degree. I just love the way it's described. So if you go in the verses, this is from like paragraph three through five. It says, while I was thus in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air where his feet did not touch the floor. He had on a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness. It was whiteness beyond any earthly thing I had ever seen, nor do I believe that any earthly thing could be made to appear so exceedingly white and brilliant. Then a little further down, not only was his robe exceedingly white, but his whole person was glorious beyond description and his countenance truly like lightning. Okay, here's what I love about this. It's not so much one phrase or one of these paragraphs as it is how Moroni comes I think this is Moroni trying to help us understand how to teach teenagers. <laughs> this is my perspective, you guys. He's 17 at the time. And when Moroni comes to give him this incredibly important message, he comes to Joseph. Where in the first vision, it was a little different and a different experience entirely when Joseph went to the grove to pray. Here, Moroni comes to him. You kind of have to put yourself in his shoes. Like, He's 17. He lives in a very small log house. He shares a room with lots of other brothers who all work really hard and they don't have air conditioning. So I just imagine what that room looked like and smelled like. And, you know, it's a boy's room. I'm sure it was tidy. You know, when you go to visit the, the site now, it's all the beds are made and the lanterns are lit and there's no toys on the floor. I don't know how it looked on this day, but I feel like the very fact that Moroni came to Joseph says something about how we should teach, especially teenagers. We need to find them where they are. We don't intend for them to stay there or to be the same person after we teach them, but we have to find ways to connect. I think 
for me, this is, we do this a lot with object lessons. You know, I find ways to incorporate things like Minecraft or Legos or fire or whatever intrigues my kids in order to meet them where they are. The next thing he teaches me is that you need to be dis distinct and clear about why you're there. Moroni doesn't, he doesn't shift. You know, oftentimes I think when we're teaching teenagers, we get the impression that we need to like lure them in with candy or something and then we can do a bait and switch and <laughs> start to teach them the gospel. Sometimes we do this with girls camp and stuff too, where, you know, you try and like wedge in little spiritual thoughts amongst all the crafts and the whatever. Moroni's not like that. He is, I think he respects the dignity of teenagers. I think he understands what they're capable of, even if they're not there yet. And so he elevates Joseph. He teaches him very clearly who he, Moroni, is and the work he has to do and who Joseph is. In fact, I love that Moroni calls him by name and invites him to be a part of this work. There's dignity in it for me. And I feel like we have to teach teenagers with dignity and assume that the truth will lure them in faster than candy and faster than crafts. I, I just think Moroni shows us that. I also love that you're directed by Moroni not to be afraid to repeat things. So for example, if you look at like paragraph 13, this is what Joseph says. By this time, so deep were the impressions made on my mind that sleep had fled from my eyes. I lay overwhelmed in astonishment at what I had both seen and heard. But what was my surprise when but what was my surprise when again I beheld the same messenger at my bedside and heard him rehearse or repeat over to me again the same things as before with an added caution. This is the same way all of you probably teach your kids now, right? Like, for example, let's say you're going to teach them, you know, multiplication facts. You're probably going to start with the ones and the fives and the tens or something. And then as they get really solid on those key numbers, then you'll slowly add in a couple more flashcards, right? But you don't inundate them with all of them at once. You just give them a little bit at a time and you practice and you practice and you start to feather in new things. That's Moroni's method. And that's why this year... We're going to use a lot of the same object lessons we've used in the past because I really think these repeated messages will create deep impressions in the mind. That's my hope is that even if these object lessons, and there'll be new ones as well, but a lot of them, if you were in the Book of Mormon course in 2020, they'll feel familiar. They'll be revised and refreshed and re-recorded, but I think they'll create these deep impressions. And Moroni taught that that's a really powerful way to connect. So we're going to embrace that this year. And I think we should embrace it in any of our teaching. Don't feel like you have to teach your kids something new and different each time. Let them get used to repetition. Let them teach what you taught them last week and see how it creates these deep impressions. Then the last one I think Moroni demonstrates is to show us why it's worth it. In this process of teaching him over the course of a night and coming back three, four times to give him these same messages, Moroni at the same time is showing why it's worth it. So for example, not only is his countenance like lightning and he hovers above the floor, but look at what you can see in this paragraph. After this communication, I saw the light in the room begin to gather immediately around the person of him who had been speaking to me. And it continued to do so until the room was again left dark, except just around him. When instantly I saw, as it were, a conduit open right up into heaven and he ascended until he entirely disappeared. And the room was left as it had been before this heavenly light had made its appearance. Okay, this might just be me, but you guys, this is like full on Doctor Strange moment. If you were like, I think what Moroni is demonstrating is he's saying like, not just I want you to believe these things and I want you to do these things, Joseph, and the Lord has a great work for you. I think he's also a physical example of why it's worth it to do them. Because you can see the light on his face. You can see the joy in his eyes. You can see him hover off the floor. You can see him glow. Like you can see him open up a conduit to go to heaven in a, an amazing way. I just think we can't discount this. I think it's, this is what President Nelson was trying to teach us when he says the kind of body that you want in the next life will be determined by how you treat this one. <laughs> like I just think we have to help our kids understand that, that we don't have a lot of, you know, examples of resurrected beings in scripture, but these key ones should teach us what a resurrected body is like and that we want it. I mean, I can't think of something I could describe for my kids that's more exciting than this, that they can go from one location to another instantly, that they can hover off the floor, that they'll be light-filled. For me, the, the appeal is that there, there is work still to be done. Moroni is still completing the work of his father. He's still completing his work. He's still finding joy in this effort. That's what appeals to me about a celestial body, this resurrected being, is you're not complacent 
You're certainly not on a beach. You're not just entertained. You are agile. You are doing things for God. In fact, in the verses, it says, Moroni came straight from God in order to give Joseph this message. I mean, that's a powerful visual, right? I don't know how that works, but I want a part of it. And I feel like our teenagers will too if we teach them the way Moroni taught. Okay, now it's time for the new part, questions to consider. My hope here, like I mentioned, is just that you will hear these questions and let them just kind of marinate. You know, I, I, you might have an immediate answer that comes to mind. You might have one that comes to you three days from now or six months from now. But my hope is that by prompting you with questions that the spirit will find ways to teach you new things. I've seen that happen every single week as I teach these YSAs. Uh, about a year into my teaching, I realized I needed to stop trying to teach so much and ask a lot more questions. Because when I ask questions, they teach each other and their insights are incredible. They're riveting actually. And when I step back a little bit, that happens. So that's what I'm hoping to do here in this portion that will stimulate your brain with ideas or at least make you get into your scriptures and want to find the answers for yourself. I don't have an answer written down. These are just ideas that I'm hoping will stir up thought. Okay, first question. This comes from the introduction page. It's in paragraph one. I think it's really interesting how he describes this book, the Book of Mormon, having a fullness of the gospel. You actually hear that from the Lord himself in the Doctrine and Covenants. So in DNC 27, 5, it says, Behold, this is wisdom in me. Wherefore, marvel not, for the hour cometh that I will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on earth and with Moroni, whom I have sent to reveal the Book of Mormon, containing the fullness of my everlasting gospel, to whom I have committed the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim. It's again in DNC 20 when they're talking about the Book of Mormon, which contains a record of a fallen people and a fullness of the gospel of Christ to the Gentiles and the Jews also. So my question is a simple one. How does the Book of Mormon provide a fullness? It doesn't have everything, right? It doesn't have all the temple ordinances laid out. It doesn't have a lot of things that are part of the gospel that we cherish. So how is it a fullness? Why is it a fullness? I hope you have some thoughts. And if you don't yet, get into scriptures and I think ideas will come to mind. So that's question one. Question two. This comes from the title page. This is in paragraph four. This is where you see the work split between Mormon and Moroni. So it actually talks about how Mormon passed on the records to his son Moroni. And I guess my question is, why do you think that happens? So often in the church, there is a, a work that is split between people. And I don't mean just to like share the load. I mean, often across generations, or for example, from one young woman's president to the next, work is split. You know, the, the work is not quite finished and so it's split. And my question is, why? Why does the Lord like group projects so much? Especially when it comes to families, why is that such an important part of this work? Over and over again in the Book of Mormon, you're gonna see fathers and sons work together to accomplish something. They're not always on the same page when that work begins, but you're gonna see fathers and sons share a burden and, and try to accomplish it together. And my question is, why? Why does the Lord, why does the Lord work like that? And is there something about passing fire of testimony from one generation to another that's implied here. I'm curious about your thoughts. Okay, third question. This comes from the introductory page on paragraph five. This is where it talks about the plates coming to Joseph in due course. I actually circled that in my scriptures because I found it so interesting that that course of time was a wide one for Joseph. You know, he first learns at 17, but he has to come back to the grove to have these interviews. In fact, that's the word he uses. He calls them interviews with Moroni, where he learns things and he comes to understand things and his life changes occur. I guess my question to you is, what do you think happened for Joseph in those intervening four years? It's almost like this temple prep period or mission prep period. So what changes do you think happened in Joseph in those four years? Why did, he, why did the Lord let these ideas and these revelations marinate for so long before he actually could get the plates and get to work? That's my next question. Okay, fourth. In the testimony of the three witnesses, you're going to see this phrase. It says, it was marvelous to our eyes. For me, when I think about marvelous, I think one of the words, one of the reasons I like that word is it sort of implies a little bit of fear. <laughs> you know, marvel, even like the characters my kids love, they have these powers that you can't quite wrap your head around, but they also do good. And so I think it's this 
It's this mix of both. And especially after what we studied in the New Testament, where we see people like the shepherds who initially fear. Even this week, when you see Joseph wake up to the angel Moroni and his first reaction is fear, but then he comes to marvel. There is this state of reverence and awe that sets in. And I guess my question to you is, where have you marveled? When it comes to the gospel and your building of your testimony, or you're studying in the scriptures, or you're participating in ordinances, what has caused you to marvel? I would love to hear your answers. Okay, last one. Number five. This is on that page from Joseph about his own witness. It says, if I would use all my endeavors to preserve them, they should be protected. This is him referring to the plates. A lot of Joseph's young married life, he gets the plates. He is married, I think, in January and gets the plates in September. So he is a newlywed, you know, he is a young adult. And he and Emma, a big part of their job are to figure out how to hide these plates because he's trying to protect them from these bad guys who want to steal them. And from his own, you know, temptations. And so he's like, I, their job is to keep the records safe during that translation process. And if you've been to the church history museum, you might've seen their cool display. I, we saw it for the first time, Violet and I thought it was awesome. It's this diorama, like you crawl into a log and inside the log, they have these miniature examples of all the places that Joseph and Emma had to hide the plates, like in a barrel of beans and under the fireplace and all these cool places. But my hope here is the question I want to ask is why? If the Lord can protect the plates, then why are Joseph and Emma needed at all? Remember when Joseph first tries to reach in to get the plates when he's 17, he stopped. Moroni stops him and says, you know, it's not time yet. It seems like the Lord could have done that for anybody who tried to touch the plates. Like, why can't he make them? Why doesn't he create a bubble around them or make it so that only Joseph can touch them? Well, why is there a risk there? Um, what do you think it offers Joseph and Emma and others that there is the possibility that they could be grabbed or stolen or, or whatever. Why, why does the Lord do it this way? And how does that apply to us in a bigger scope? So again, these are just questions to get you started, just to start conversations in your classes or in your families. And if you have thoughts that you want to share with the group, I hope you'll go on to gather.macmom.com and add them to the community board so that we can share ideas off each other's. Mm -hmm.